Hello, this is Daniel King reporting on round eight of the London Chess Classic. I'm still here in the commentary room, um, but let me give you a report of uh, today's events. Some of great stuff going on today. Uh, extraordinary games. Let me start with McShane against Polgar. Well, this one was the first to finish. Um, Luke, I'm afraid, got well and truly mangled today. Uh, Udit found some form. And, well, in this position, you can see that White's king is rather badly trapped in the corner. You can see these this diagonal is open, and this knight is dreadfully placed. Uh, it actually prevents the king moving out. And here there was, well, a terrible um, finish. Knight a4 was played by Udit. And the point is, if the queen moves up, then the rook comes down and Black's, uh, Black manages to catch White's king on the back rank. Um, you can see there's, there's no real way out. If knight e1, then bishop d2 is a killing pin. So Luke sacrificed the exchange, but this was absolutely hopeless. And again, the rook came to the back rank. And bishop d2 was an absolute killer. So Judith, um wins the game, um, but Luke having a really tough time. Okay, now the game I'd like to move on to is Anand against Nakamura. Now this game was really long. There were so many ups and downs. It was it was a fantastically entertaining game. Um, what I'm going to do is I can't <laughs> go through the whole thing. It, it was too long, too complicated. I'm going to take you through a couple of moments uh, where you know maybe there was an improvement for one of the players. Now here we join the game in a really unclear situation where Anand has taken lots of kingside pawns and is very compact here and that means his king is actually much safer than blacks but it's incredibly complex you know Nakamura has these two central pawns if they can fly down the board well you know black is doing well Anand played knight c3 here um, but it looks like rook f1 was a better move, and Anand actually said after the game that he had calculated this. He actually, uh, you know, he wanted to play this, but wasn't exactly sure. Um, let's have a look at the idea. I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea, actually, giving the piece up, but coming down to f7. And, of course, if, if the knight, knight moves, then we can take the bishop. Black desperately needs to counterattack, so, okay... Rook b3 check. Now if g3, that would be an absolute disaster. The rook comes down and um, threatens threatens a mate on, on h2. And remember, this rook can't move to h1 because of king takes rook here. So after rook b3 check, the king has to come back. Uh, Anand said he'd analysed all this, or something like it, anyway. But he just he wasn't quite sure. Um, the line goes like this, rook d7. Now the point is that white threatens knight f6 check and then rook h7 mate. So rook g2 has to be played. I mean, black can only, these are all forced moves. But Anand said he got kind of confused around here. He wasn't quite sure. But it looks like this should be winning for white. For instance, here, king comes up the board. Now, the rook has defended the mate on h7, but actually white's king is in such a good position, uh, you know, can't really be attacked any longer, and now rook c1 looks like an absolute killer, but somehow Anand lost confidence in this variation, it was very long, he wasn't quite sure, and in the end he chose another move, knight c3, and the game stumbled on into an extraordinary endgame. After 40 moves, they reached this endgame where we have two connected pass pawns for black on the queen side, three for white on the king side, and you know, really strange material balance. Anand was probably doing well, but he lost his way, and in fact, Nakamura had a win right at the end. Nakamura was the first to queen. We got this extraordinary position queen against rook and three pawns. And Nakamura was actually very short of time. Vichy really hustled him. And here, Nakamura played queen e1. 
Anand move the king to the side, um, but here it was just a draw by perpetual check. There was nothing more to be done. Um, this rook is loose on b8, but it's simply not possible to pick it up if white plays carefully and accurately, and here they just agree to draw by perpetual check. But if we go back to that critical moment here, well, it's very hard to tell during a game that it's a critical moment. Nakamura said that he'd considered queen a4 check. This is looks like it's a winning move. But after king e5, he'd only looked at queen c6. Now, it's, it's not possible to pick this loose rook up with a check. There's a really subtle move here. Queen c6, no check. But it's quite extraordinary. There seems to be no way for white to find security. The threat, of course, is to play queen d6, check, picking up the rook. But there's no good square for that rook. Um, if g7, you want to get a queen, of course, then you pick up the rook anyway, and the queen, by a miracle, stops the pawn queening. If, for example, well, rook h8, well, queen f6 will pick up the rook. Um, rook b2 loses to queen c3 check. Rook b1 is probably the best try, but it seems as though with an accurate sequence that black can pick up this rook. For example, well, king g4, we keep checking. If king e4, then queen c2 wins the rook. And, well, finally we're going to get there. King e5 and, well, these, these squares are mined. You know, there'll be a well, a check on d3 to pick up the rook. So it seems as though black is winning in all variations, but what a subtle move. Queen c6, there are no checks. It's really beautiful. At this point, Nakamura had something like three moves to go to the time control and only about two minutes, a minute and a half, something like that. So very, very difficult to see. So this crazy game finally ended in a draw. In the other games, we had Kramnik against Jones. Now, this was a really important game for, well, to decide who will win the tournament, actually. If Kramnik could beat Jones, then he would still have a chance to win the first prize because uh, Magnus Carlsen was actually sitting out today. It was his turn to have a free day. Kramnik, I thought, played a brilliant game. He was so solid. It was such a, a kind of typical performance for him. After, well, the opening, Kramnik had his usual fianchetto and solid kingside position and pressure against these two pawns. He'd somehow tricked uh, Jones in the opening into a system that he, Jones wasn't very familiar with, and Kramnik just got a perfect position. He played queen b5. And it feels as though black's position is already kind of creaking here. This is almost a fourth sequence to go into this end game. Now, if black wants to avoid just going a pawn down, he has to go in for this. So it's an exchange sacrifice where white Kramnik has two pawns and a bishop against a rook. But the point is, white is absolutely rock solid. There are no weaknesses. No weaknesses at all in White's position. And slowly but surely, Kramnik came forward. Let me leap ahead to this position where Kramnik really has got control. The important thing is not to exchange rooks too early and not to exchange off the bishops. They, they work so well together. And Garmin Jones had simply no counterplay here. But it was fantastic to see the way uh, Kramnik squeezed in this position. So he just slowly pressed on the king side, so keeping threats on both sides of the board. I think the key was not to advance this pawn too quickly because it actually covers white's king side, prevents the rook checking from the side. So Kramnik slowly advanced, but he's got his king up the board and slowly squashed the black's king. You know, the king simply cannot join any defense on the queen side. And, well, that's that's a great move. Of course, the bishop hitting the rook and the pawn here, so the rook had to come back. Now here, only here, right at the end, Kramnik exchanges rooks and comes in with the king. 
you'll notice the king simply can't come across because the bishop covers that square. And now it's time just to advance the pawn. And with the support of the king, it's it's gone. And this was the final move. Kramnik is just going to play bishop d6, exchange off, and then cruising with the pawn and supported by the king. That's the end of that. So Kramnik <coughs> won, and that means <coughs> he has 15 points. He's on in second place. Carlson has 17 points. So Kramnik, if he wins tomorrow, can possibly catch Carlson. Now, last round pairings are really important. Carlson has the white pieces against Anand. Well, of course, not an easy opponent. Adams is playing Kramnik, but Kramnik has the black pieces. Still, if Carlson Anand is a draw, and Kramnik manages to, to defeat Adams, then there'll be a tie for first place. So everything's still open. And then we're promised that they're going to play, if that happens, an Armageddon blitz match to decide the title. So things still wide open at the top of the tournament. Thanks very much for watching.